Um, and so some of you might find some parts of this familiar because some of you have uh, were present when I gave kind of the beginning of this project in 2018. And to those, I apologize, but maybe it's just fun to see me um, try expand expand this into a kind of larger theory. Um, ah, now this doesn't want to move. Okay, so um, when we kind of there's two there's two ways that we might think about argumentation. Um, or then not, not us. Argumentation theorists always think about argumentation as um, this kind of great thing that we want to um, um, that we want to make even better. But in general, there's kind of two views of argumentation that are kind of at opposite sides. There's the view that argumentation is basically fighting and we should avoid it. And then there's a very different view of argumentation that can be captured in phrases such as that argumentation is or should be the meeting of the minds. And argumentation theorists tend to kind of even define argumentation as the exchange of reason or the determination of the balance of reasons. So they don't define it like that when they are careful about their definitions, but they define it like that in passing. You find that in many papers when people just kind of say what argumentation is in, in passing. And this creates in us this kind of idea of argumentation um, that can be represented in the metaphor of a kind of magical scale. Um, we can put our, right, we have this magical scale between us when we argue and we put our reasons on it and it measures them. And in the end, it tells us which conclusion or resolution to an issue is best supported by the balance of reasons. And that obviously is like a beautiful picture because if we understand argumentation like that, it kind of seems obvious that resolving issues, so doubts or disagreements or any other kind of issue, issue through argument is really morally valuable. First of all, because um, we have moral reasons to come to the uh, most just decisions or the most fair outcomes or the best compromises, or we, we even have moral reasons to want to figure out what the truth is, because presumably, right, at the very least, having true beliefs kind of is better at contributing to our well-being than having false beliefs. So, right, resolving things to argumentation seems to be kind of consequentialist, good from a consequentialist point of view, it's because it's epistemically responsible. And second, we can think that if we understand argumentation like this, then it's morally valuable, because it arguing like that kind of expressly expresses respect for the other's dignity. If we say we want to resolve an issue by through arguing, and if we understand arguing in this kind of scale metaphor, um, then we kind of at the same time say we want to resolve the issue by kind of drawing the reasons into the process. And that is kind of an expression of the of respect for the dignity, given that you know you often we think of dignity as as uh, requiring that we acknowledge other people as reasonable beings who have standing to contribute um, to the resolution of issues that concern them. So argumentation understood in this way as this kind of magical scale with which we can share and, and weigh reasons seems to be kind of morally valuable. Engaging in it seems to be morally valuable. Valuable, but of course, arguing is not really a direct exchange of reasons. Like I can't take a reason out of my head and put it in yours. And magical scales, unfortunately, don't exist except in the land of unicorns. And so, these moral goods that argumentation that argumentation can give us is, are not automatically there. In fact, kind of right. One of the main points, or the whole point, why we have introduction to logic or introduction to critical thinking classes or rhetoric classes and force as many students through them as we can possibly do it and fuss about how we can create them best um, is that kind of argumentation is easily abused. Then we can easily get very far away from the magical scale picture that we seem to love so much. And so, for example, we teach students that they have to avoid fallacies and also that they're not supposed to fall for them. And fallacies are, as we all know, arguments that are good at persuading people, but they don't actually offer good reasons. And so we teach them, right, fallacy names, and then we give them description of what these fallacies are. For example, we teach them that there's an appeal to threat, and then we tell them that that persuades by influencing what the person perceives as prudent to believe because we've threatened them or to do because we threaten them rather than giving them evidence for what is actually true or what is actually the best thing to do. Um, what, does have, what does this have to do with ethics? What has have, what has uh, teaching people to avoid fallacies have to do with ethics. Well, um, right, 
fallacies are deceptions. Um, we kind of, we pretend to be offering reasons when we are really not, or when we are really not offering reasons that are relevant to the issue that we're trying to resolve, which means that if I use a fallacy, I kind of knowingly risk that you will adopt false beliefs or agree to unfair or unjust or unwise decisions, and that can negatively impact your well-being. So I'm knowingly risking negative, negative impacts on you. And in addition, I also don't treat you with respect anymore. Rather, I treat you with kind of express disrespect, right? I, I pretend that we're engaging in this enterprise where we want to resolve an issue through, through an integration of all our reasons. Um, but really what I'm trying to do is to attempt to circumvent your rationality in order to get what I want. So I'm kind of treating you as an obstacle, an object that I have to overcome instead. In addition to this, um, to things like teaching students about fallacies and, 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 and argument structures and so on, we also teach them some norms of argumentation that seem to be more obviously or closely connected to ethics. Like we teach them about virtues like open-mindedness, or we teach them kind of broad, um, morally relevant principles like the principle of charity. And so it seems like, at least in these introductory textbooks, and also sometimes when we read papers about fallacies or argumentation in general, like we're trying to create or um, a kind of um, set of universal argumentative norms that are going to make people better arguers. And very least, when I give the critical thinking class to my students, I often feel like I'm trying to give them a set of rules that will then help them to be good arguers in any con context context, like the commandments of good argumentation. But the question can be asked whether this is even possible. Can, can we even make such a set of rules that are, that are going to be useful no matter what kind of argument you're in? Well, there is at least one indication that there might be a problem with that, and that is that there doesn't seem to be a rule of argumentation that isn't controversial within argumentation theory. So I don't, I haven't yet found a fallacy where there is not a whole line of papers discussing when the fallacy is actually, or when this type of argument is actually not a fallacy. There doesn't seem to be a single rule that always applies, at least that always applies in the same sense, right? Most of the fallacies are argument types that are often fallacious or sometimes fallacious, but sometimes they're completely appropriate. Even such, even arguments that on first sight where you might think, well, when can this ever be okay? Like arguments from thread. When you think about the ways that we argue, you figure out, well, you know, threats are okay as long as the argument that we're having is a negotiation. So if fallacies aren't certain types of arguments, then what are they? And here I want to bring in um, Douglas Walton, who, who created the theory of um, dialogue types in order to explain what fallacies are. So Douglas Walton says that whether an argument is fallacious or not cannot be determined by looking at the argument without its context. Um, so fallaciousness is not just about the argument structure. Not everything that uses a threat is fallacious. It's also about the context in which the argument is used. So we have to ask ourselves in order to figure out whether we're dealing with a fallacy, whether the argument that we have just, been, have just encountered serves any legitimate pur purpose in the context of the broader argument that we're having with each other. So does it contribute to the goals of the kind of interaction that is taking place or does it subvert those goals? And in order to be able to kind of give us a theory that allows us um, to turn, to use this for the practical evaluation of arguments, he gives us, and I apologize for this enormous table, don't worry, we're not gonna go through everything on it. Um, he gives us these, six, and later on he acknowledges another one, seven dialogue types, though I didn't fit the seventh one on there because it was already full enough. Um, so, right, so he kind of, he distinguishes between six different kinds of ways that we can argue, and all of them are different with respect to the kinds of goals they want to come to, to the initial situations that they start out with, and to the things that can be expected of the arguers to do while they are in this type of argument. So we can compare, for example, a persuasion type of argument or dialogue with a negotiation or a deliberation, right? The persuasion type, if we are in a kind of argument that is structured like a persuasion dialogue, then we are usually dealing with a conflict of opinions, right? Each of our goals is, of the arguer's goals is to persuade who the others that their conclusion is correct. And so their burden of proof is 
um, to show that their conclusion is acceptable and that based on premises that the others will accept. And so the goal of the whole, the whole dialogue goes well if the issue or the disagreement is resolved, or at least if, if all parties kind of clarify what the disagreements are. And it usually or is intended to end with one party winning, or at least um, people now know better why, why they can't kind of figure out who wins. By contrast, like negotiations don't aim at this kind of thing, rather they aim at a kind of reasonable settlement or a, a um, compromise that everybody can live with. And so the, the tasks that the arguers have are different. They have to make offers and threats in order, right, and respond to them in order to figure out what this compromise might be. And then, for example, the deliberation is yet different because it kind of arises out of doubt about what to do. So you have the, the, the people together, the arguers together have some kind of dilemma or practical choice to make. And, they, and the goal is then to find the best course of action. And so they all have kind of a joint burden to find as many reasons in any direction as possible, develop them together and evaluate them in order to figure out what they should do. So these are very different kinds of ways to argue, right? And so the idea is that we can understand what a fallacy is if we realize that, for example, an argument from threat uh, in a negotiation provides exactly the kind of reason that is expected in, in a negotiation. So if you use it, you don't pretend like you give a reason and you're actually not. In fact, you are giving exactly the kind of reason that everybody expects to come out of it. And it is a reason that contributes well towards the goal of right, finding a good compromise that everybody can live with, as long as the threats aren't the wrong kinds of threats. Um, right? And you're also not a kind of um, expressing disrespect for anyone's dignity because you're not trying to circumvent their rationality. In fact, you instead you're kind of doing exactly what they expected you to do. You're giving exactly the reasons that they expected it to do. And so the argument from threat in negotiation is also morally permissible. However, right, if you then use an argument from threat, for example, in a deliberation, then what your usage becomes this kind of deception that I talked about earlier. Why? Well, right, because using this kind of argument might make might persuade people because they know the argument, the argument type from other contexts as functioning there. And so they might accept that it provides a reason. But in this dialogue type, within the context of the deliberation, this kind of argument doesn't actually help get to the goal of determining what the best possible course of action is, right? Threatening, threatening people that they have to do what you want doesn't actually help figuring out what the best course of action would be if you take all reasons into account. Right, so the perception is false that this argument is a, it provides legitimate reasons, and therefore your use of it in order to make people believe that they've been given a legitimate reason is deceptive. Right, we can also formulate it like this, and this is a bit closer to what Walton would have said. Right, the argument kind of disrupts the creation of the specific kind of validity that this that the deliberation can produce by introducing an argument that really belongs into a negotiation dialogue into the deliberation, if that argument then influences the outcome, then you kind of disrupts the creation of, of a certain kind of validity, namely the one that after the deliberation, everybody will think the outcome has. And that's the problem. That's where the deception lies. So Walton, when he writes, isn't especially interested in the ethics of argumentation, moral implications of all this. But we can apply it to it and see that Right, the moral reasons that I talked about not to use fallacies do always apply, but what they mean for an individual argument that we might find ourselves in is really context dependent. Right, whether some argument is deceptive in the way that makes fallacies morally unacceptable depends on the kind of dialogue it's used in, and the moral reasons against using fallacies stem from their deceptiveness. So for any kind of argument type, you have to see whether these moral reasons apply in the context of the dialogue type. And the argument that I want to make is that this is not only applicable to the norms that we have against using fallacies, rather it's gonna have to be applicable to all norms of argumentation that kind of direct us to argue ethically. All of this them will, in what they actually mean for our argumentative behavior, be sensitive to the kind of dialogue that we're having. 
And as an example, I want to use the principle of charity. So to kind of illustrate this, I'm going to use the principle of charity, first of all, because I can assume that everybody already knows it. We use it constantly in, in introduction to logic or introduction to critical thinking ones. I don't think I know a textbook that doesn't mention it at the very least. And also it seems to be a principle that's more easily connected to ethics than fallacy. So th this idea that it might be a moral principle is more easily accessible than when it comes to um, kind of argumentative fallacies. So the way, the, the, the way that I will talk about the principle of charity is this, I will say the principle of charity requires that we interpret arguments such that you can see why from the point of view of the arguer, given their worldview, these arguments succeed in supporting the conclusion. So you have to interpret the argument with the goal to figure out how what the arguer said from their point of view um, supports the conclusion. And if you disagree with the point of view, that, that, right, that can happen, but you have to see why the argument makes sense, basically. And this is a kind of really um, vague definition because I'm not because the kind of the very, the way that charity should be employed is not at the center of the talk. So I'm using this kind of easily, easily to, easy to remember definition. We can, right, we can, we can make a connection to fallacies here because we can contrast the use of the principle of charity with, or we can contrast the use of charity with straw manning, which we could, we could theoretically describe as extremely negligent or intentional non-charity as doing the opposite of what charity would be, namely you kind of, you distort the argument, right? So why would we, right, what are the moral reasons for charity? Um, there are, by the way, epistemic and prudential reasons for charity, but I'm not going to concern myself with them here. But what I want to kind of show is that charity is, the principle of charity can be read as a moral principle. So why would we be charitable from a moral point of view? Well, there's kind of two arguments that fit well with the two reasons I gave earlier why argumentation would be morally valuable. There's a kind of, we can say there's a deontological argument from charity and you're gonna see that it fits really closely together with why I said argumentation is valuable from a deontological point of view. Namely, right, when you engage with someone in argument, it means that you at least pretend that you're gonna be in this kind of reciprocal enterprise in which you resolve an issue by trying to figure out what the balance of reasons is including the reasons that they have to offer. And so if you then not attempt to interpret their arguments charitably, as in trying to figure out what kinds of reasons they're trying to offer, then it implies that it's not important to you to integrate their reason. And that kind of denies their equal standing as a reasonable being, right? They say, you are not as important as my reasons are more important than yours. And that denies this kind of basic equality that dignity is supposed to set up and that's humiliating. So it's, it's wrong not to use charity from this from a deontological point of view. And you can also make consequential arguments for charity, right? You can just kind of follow, um, follow the consequential arguments you have for arguing in the kind of magical scale point of view and say, look, if, if, you, don't, if you don't interpret char charitably, you're gonna miss out on reasons. And if you have moral kind of moral reasons for what, um, wanting to integrate as many reasons as possible in order to get have a better chance at getting to true conclusions or just decisions, then that is bad. You can also say, look at the deontological argument I just gave you, even if you don't like deontological arguments, people notice when they are excluded from an, from a kind of, from an activity that they were immediately first invited into, and that hurts. If you realize that people are not taking seriously, that um, you suffer emotional and psychological harms, and depending on how important the argument is and how often this happens, those can be significant. And then you can also say, right, look, um, if there's any consequential reasons for why the person had um, a right to be part of the argument in the first place, for why they should be part of determining what, how to resolve the issue in the first place, then those reasons are kind of automatically also apply to um, having to interpret them, them in a way that kind of aims at real figuring out what the reasons are that they're trying to offer. So it seems like we have kind of, if you, like, if you don't like one of these arguments, you might like the other. It seems like we have kind of a pretty good, generally applicable moral reasons to be charitable in argument. But uh, the problem is that this, this set of reasons is super uninformative when it comes to telling us how we're actually supposed to behave while we argue, because it doesn't tell us anything about how much effort we have to in invest 
in figuring out what the other what reasons the other one is trying to offer right saying you have to interpret arguments such that you can see why from the point of view of the arguer they succeed in supporting their conclusions you have not yet said whether you for that you have to be willing to spend three hours kind of talking with them and exploring their psychology or whether that just means that you should try not to straw man Right, there's a huge line of effort that you could invest. You can, on the one hand, just say, I'm going to put in enough effort that I know that I'm not hugely negligent in my interpretation. Or you could say, I'm going to put in as much effort as is required to understand this person. And if it means that I have to talk to them for days, then that's just it. It seems, right, when you kind of hear these arguments for charity first, it seems like you could justify with them that you should put a lot of effort in. You should put as much effort in as you can possibly spare. But there are argumentation theorists that have offered very good arguments against this idea. Levinsky, for example, has offered such an argument. He has argued, and at least in the types of arguments that Levinsky has in mind, this is not an acceptable outcome. So Levinsky argues that charity would require arguers to exert considerable time and effort in an attempt to help their interlocutors make their reasons understood, which is true. That's exactly what my definition of charity said. But when they argue against others, arguers are tasked with developing their own arguments. It would be unfair to ask them to aid the enemy. So, um, right, so the idea is something like if you have a persuasion type dialogue, then you have given arguers different kinds of tasks and each one has the responsibility to make their case strongest. It wouldn't be fair to kind of direct their limited energy and attention to making someone else's case strongest. Because in a persuasion dialogue, you will argue to win. In addition to that, right, argumentation kind of relies on this competition or at least this kind of argumentation relies on this competition between the arguers in a kind of survival of the fittest style of search for the truth, right? You let the arguments fight and the true ones will win out. And in the end, when the dust is settled, only the truth reminds. Now, Levinsky is not like, Levinsky is not pretending like he, like he talks about all argumentation. He is self-conscious conscious in the fact that he is using a confrontational model of argumentation that's similar to what I already called Walton's persuasion dialogue. Right? And that is to him the paradigmatic model of argumentation. And that's where his argument derives from. Right? And admittedly, if we think of argumentation in this model, or very always very close to the persuasion dialogue that we already talked about, then there is no problem with not investing a lot of effort into charity. After all, right, if arguers are happy to participate in this kind of argument, then they know that they will be responsible to take care of their own claims and their own reasons, right? So many problems with not investing a lot of effort into charity just disappear. Um, arguers are being included in the argument exactly as they thought they would be. Um, and it, that is not humiliating because your reasons are taken into account exactly as you thought they would be taken into account and you are not asked to take other people's reasons into account in any different way. Right. And if the argument works well, so if this idea of the survival of the fittest works and the truth does stand in the end, if that's a good structure to uh, resolve the issue that you're having, then you also don't have to worry about any kind of consequential harms that might arise from not investing a lot of charity. So in confrontational, confrontational argumentation, as for example, the persuasion dialogue, we're not required to invest that much effort into charity, just enough to avoid straw manning, including kind of culpably negligent straw manning. But, right, we have already seen that there's structures other than the confrontational persuasion dialogue structure. And these structures are suitable for the pursuit of different goals and they structure arguments differently and they give the arguers different tasks. So let's compare, right? Remember I compared earlier on the persuasion dialogue where the goal is to resolve a disagreement usually by figuring out who, who wins, who can show the other that their conclusion are acceptable after all. And the burden of proof or the task that each arguer has is to show, right, that the, the proponent has the task to show the opponent that um, their claim is acceptable based on premises that the opponent is willing to accept. So you have this kind of structuring of the argument that both already know. But if you look at the at a deliberation dialogue, for example, that starts out with the arguers sharing doubt, having kind of about how they should make a practical choice, 
and the goal is for them all together to decide what the best course of action is, then you have tasks that they kind of share a joint burden to come up with possible solutions and then reasons for all solutions. No one has kind of has to take over one claim by themselves. So a deliberation aims at formulating arguments in all directions together. And that means that Levinsky's arguments against requiring arguers to use a lot of charity don't apply anymore. Uh, quite the opposite, right? In a deliberation, because of how it's structured, because the idea is that all arguers contribute to developing all arguments as far as, as to, to as good a state as they can be, not investing considerable effort into a charitable reading when someone says something that isn't quite clear at the beginning, would be humiliating and potentially harmful. It would be humiliating because if you don't invest any effort into figuring out what reasons they were trying to give, you kind of send the message that their reasons aren't worth the effort, which kind of sets them below the rest of the participants. And you also now risk right, losing out on these reasons and that harms the kind of ability of the dialogue to get to the goal that it wants. So if arguers are in a deliberation, the same arguments for charity that only result in a little required effort during persuasion dialogues suddenly result in a lot of required effort in deliberations. The moral, which means that the moral arguments for charity apply in a similar way as the moral arguments against fallacies did, right? The moral arguments for charity are applicable in each case of arguing, but the payout, what they actually require from the behavior of arguments depends on the dialogue type. So, which means that we cannot simply teach students a bunch of rules that will always apply, right? They're all dependent on dialogue type. So now we can ask, is it maybe then enough that we just teach them what and six, what and six dialogue types and tell them that the rules go, the rules that go along with them? I don't think that's enough either, right? The choice of dialogue type is also morally relevant, um, and so we can, and so arguers are also morally responsible to choose the correct dialogue type. And choosing the dialogue type is part of the activity of arguing. So the moral reasons that apply to which dialogue type should be chosen in what context are moral reasons about how we should behave during argument. So it, this was a big claim, and in order to support it, I need to answer at least two questions, right? I need to explain why the choice of dialogue type is so morally relevant and possibly also which kinds of considerations should factor into this choice. And I need to explain what I mean when I say that um, this choice is done through arguing, that choosing the dialogue type is part of the activity of arguing and therefore part of the kind of moral guidance we need to give people when they wanna argue. So we need to talk about what the mechanism is by which these things are chosen and who's responsible for the choice. I'm gonna start with the first one just because uh, what I have to say about that will impact what I have to say about the second one. So there's two reasons why this choice is more relevant. The first one maybe being more obvious than the second one. The first one is just because the different dialogue types um, are designed to take different kinds of reasons into account, there can be consequentialist reasons for why you would want to use one dialogue type rather than another in order to resolve some kind of issue. Um, and the second one is that because the different dialogue types put different tasks on arguers, they design, they, they involve different roles that arguers need to take in order for the dialogue type to work, right? They come with uh, kind of different requirements on the arguers for being able to successfully participate. So let's look at the first one first. Right. If you kind of remember the, the differences between the persuasion dialogue, the negotiation, and the deliberation, right? They all kind the way that they organize what arguers' tasks are means that they organize, they make it more or less likely that certain reasons will be taken into account. So, for example, if you are in a persuasion dialogue because each arguer has the task to show why their claim is acceptable, give with premises that the other one will accept. The reasons for or against the claim uh, in the that the disagreements is about will be integrated. But for example, you'll probably not integrate reasons for why, you know, instead of either the claim that the proponent has nor the, the like the claim that maybe the opponent has, there's a, a kind of third thing. So there's reasons that are going to just kind of not come up. 
the negotiation limits it down even further, right? The negotiation will kind of only take reasons into account that you can formulate as offers or threats. And then by contrast, the deliberation, because the kind of goal is just to find the best possible course of action, is going to kind of collect a lot of reasons, everything that's applicable to figuring out what's best to do, right? But if you have an issue like, what should we do? What should be done with the extra money left over at the end of the month? Or which kind of dog should the family buy? You can theoretically resolve each of these with any of these dialogue types. But, any, but using any of the dialogue types to resolve them might change the outcome. And so often there will be consequential reasons that just kind of apply to the question, which kinds of reasons should figure into the outcome that we will have at the end? And that will determine which dialogue type is best to use. Right now, we could ask why not always deliberate if those integrate the most reasons. And you know um, that argumentation takes place under time and uh, resource constraints, right? So you might not have the time to think about all reasons. You also might have already tried to deliberate and you don't get anywhere. And now a decision has to be made. Face and relationship goals can figure into this. So if a deliberation would require you to kind of um, give reasons that you don't want to give because they're personal. It might be more comfortable for everyone to be in a persuasion. So there's kind of all kinds of consequential reasons that might exclude certain kinds of dialogue types and then you choose the one that's best. So that's one possible answer. I'm sure there's others for why you want to do this. Okay, right. Um, so there, this is one of the reasons for why it's morally kind of relevant which dialogue type you choose and why you can't just tell students go with the rules that the dialogue type gives you. The other reasons why it's morally relevant which dialogue type you choose is because not every argument might be able to fully participate in any dialogue type given the context in which the argument takes place. Because dialogue types give arguers specific roles and those roles require certain abilities in order to fulfill them. So just really quickly, what are roles, right? Roles, by, when we talk, when I talk about roles, I literally just mean social roles, just in res res respect to argumentation. So roles are generally collections of norms, tasks, and goals, and typical behaviors that we all know about. We're socialized into knowing these clusters. Um, and typically, roles come in sets. So you, for example, you have teacher roles, and in order for there to be a teacher, you need a student. So teacher and student roles are a set, and we know, right, what the typical behaviors of teachers are, we know what their tasks are, we know what they are supposed, right, what their supposed goals are, and there's a set of norms about how teachers can behave acceptably and not. And we're socialized to be able to play a vast variety of roles and to recognize it when other people play them and to know kind of which sets belong together. This is kind of, this kind of knowledge comes into effect, for example, when we say, don't treat me like you're my mother, you're not my mother. It's because we recognize that someone's behaving just like someone who would have the mother role and we are not willing to take the child role. Okay. Um, so the, persu the persuasion dialogue and the deliberation dialogue and all the other dialogues, because they set up a certain structure for people to argue in, also set up roles and these roles come with norms and expectations. For example, in the persuasion dialogue, if you want to be a proponent or opponent in this type of dialogue, you will have to take full responsibility for your claim. You will have to um, kind of support it with clear arguments. You have to defend it against objections from the other side. And so this comes along with the typical set of behaviors, namely that you will present your arguments in an assertive way, in a direct way, that you will display confidence that you know, you're right and the other one's wrong and so on. In deliberation, because here this is this kind of cooperative bringing reasons together, things look very different, right? In order to play a deliberative role well, um, you have to have you have to fulfill different tasks, right? You have to kind of offer up all the arguments in all directions that you can think of, even if they're not finished, and then help build arguments up in all directions from everyone else. And this comes with typical behaviors like that you're going to sound a little tentative, that you will uh, display thoughtfulness that you will be willing to use unfinished arguments because you expect others to help you fill them out. Now, the thing is that right, these kinds of roles require abilities from arguers. In order to be a good proponent, 
you need to be reflectively aware of your reasons so that you can communicate them and you need to also be able to formulate them in a way that others will easily understand. And right, in order to display the typical behavior of this persuasion dialogues, that the typical assertive direct behavior, you have to be comfortable expressing yourself like that. If you can't do this, then it is less likely that your reasons will be taken into account in the final resolution, because if you don't uh, show the typical behavior, people might miss out on recognizing that you're even trying to argue. Um, if you try, if you can't formulate your reasons well yet, people, right, because they don't aren't required to be charitable, will attack your arguments before they're fully finished, and they will kind of die on the vine, um, e even if the reasons might have been good ones if you could have gotten them across. And so, as a result, um, if arguers can't fulfill the kind of law requirements, then you have kind of high risks that you will have epistemic losses and unfair distributions of practical advantages or disadvantages because you're getting really far away from the magical scale idea, right? Reasons are being left out, even though arguers might be trying to offer them. Can we expect that uh, um, everybody is always able to fulfill the conditions for playing a proponent role well? No, we can't expect that at all, right? You, you probably already know this, right? Sometimes we have to argue about some kind of, um, some way that we think an issue should be resolved or could be resolved way before we really come fully aware of what our reasons are. Like sometimes we would need one and a half hours of intense discussion with our mother before we can explain to others why it is that we think something's right or wrong or should be done or shouldn't be done. And if we have to, right, and if we don't get to talk to our mothers for these one and a half hours, we might still have the reasons accessible on maybe an emotional level, but we don't have them accessible to present them in the kinds of arguments that are required for a persuasion style dialogue. And so if we have, if we're forced into one at the wrong time, we might lose the argument just because we can't get our reasons across. As for the kind of be behavioral requirements, right? This is something that feminist philosophers of argumentation have pointed out a while ago. So I'm gonna use their example, right? Kind of traditionally and still sometimes today, female gendered people are socialized to be agreeable, submissive and demure. That's kind of, the way to be a polite female person sometimes. Um, so, right, but arguing adversarial to, to have to inhabit the proponent role well requires that you're not agreeable, demure, and submissive, right? If you formulate your arguments with an air like that, people might even miss out on realizing that there are even arguments you're trying to give. So, if you're a traditionally socialized female gender person, you can either fulfill your role as woman well or your role as proponent opponent. So what happens to you when you have to argue in a persuasion dialogue? Well, you either lose the argument or you will at least think that you lose the affection of others. And if you lose the affection of others, as we all know, we don't listen to the people we don't like, you might lose the argument just because no one's willing to listen to you anymore. In other words, forcing someone who's uh, kind of socialized in this traditional white middle-class female gendered way into a persuasion dialogue might make it kind of impossible or reason unreasonably hard for them to get their reasons across. And then they lose the argument illegitimately, even though they have the better reasons, for example. And then the, the harms that accompany that come with it. And to add insult to injury, everybody thinks that because right, it was an argument, it was carried out correctly, the outcome now is just or true or fair. And that's humiliating. Not to mention that the persuasion dialogue's validity type can't isn't right. The, the validity it can create hasn't really been created because the reasons couldn't be integrated in the way that it's it's hoped to be for these kinds of dialogues. And this is kind of one of the things, among other things, that we can mean when we say that someone's the night voice or a silence during an argument, right? It means that even though they can technically speak. The structure of the interaction makes it too hard for them to get their points across. They are not going to be heard. And this kind of problem is not limited either to persuasion dialogues or to traditionally socialized female gendered arguments. That's just the example that I use. Because silencing an argument happens whenever the structure of the argument makes it unreasonably hard for a person to get their reasons across, and that happens 
when by, because of the interaction between the properties of the person or the context in which the argument happens and the structure of the dialogue, what the argument type requires of the person to do in order to fulfill the role spell. So any dialogue type paired with the wrong context or personal characteristics of the argument can become silencing and therefore harmful in the morally relevant ways that I've talked about. In fact, right, this, is, this might be kind of look ironic, the high charity demands that deliberations come with can be the reason why someone can't fully participate in a deliberation. Imagine that, you know, um, some coworker has bullied you because of your hair color and kind of claimed in front of everyone that everybody with your hair color is, is like intellectually inferior. And so you complain about harassment to your boss and your boss said, well, you know, you two should deliberate about two questions, whether hair color really is connected to intellectual inferiority and whether saying that constitutes harassment. And you now you have to be charitable, right? You have to develop, help the other develop the arguments or have to try and see why the other one would have a point when they claim that you're stupid because your hair is red. And that can be so humiliating and emotionally taxing that you just cannot do it. Um, so, right, this is not kind of restricted to a specific argument type. So what have we seen so far? We've seen that the choice of the dialogue type can itself lead to epistemic and practical harms or losses and to humiliation. And therefore it's important to design arguments appropriately to choose the right kind of dialogue. So the next thing that I have to talk about is how this happens, right? Why did I say that this is part of arguing that having to choose the right dialogue type is part of how we should argue? Because, right, Walton and, and some others, so the pragma dialectics too, suggest that, right, arguers can move through stages in an argument. And so a stage called the opening stage comes before people argue on the object level. And in the opening stage, they determine, they basically consent mutually to the type of argument they're going to have. But this approach, I think, is only useful in the context of like highly abstract models. It's not useful if we're interested in the ethics of arguing in kind of real life everyday arguments. And that's for two reasons. First of all, kind of, you can get into an infinite regress, right? Um, this has been um, pointed out by Jacobs. You can, can the pro problem of determining how you should argue is gonna repeat itself when you have to argue about which dialogue type you should use. So you can have a situation where someone says in the opening stage, let's have a persuasion dialogue. And the other one says, well, I would rather have a deliberation. And the reaction is to say, you have to prove that the deliberation is better. And so you get this kind of infinite regress that you can only get out of if you use non-argumentative means to force a kind of resolution of what dialogue type you're going to have. And that could then undermine the legitimacy of the entire outcome. In addition to that, it's also just highly unrealistic that in practice, people will talk about how, how they're gonna argue every time before they're arguing. I mean, I tried to count the arguments I got into in a single day, including like things like, what's the best way to get to the supermarket and who is to take the dog out? And I think it's like between 25 and 50 a day. So it's very unrealistic that we sit down and make these decisions every single time. It's much more realistic to realize that we make, that these things happen while we are already arguing on the object level. And this is something that right design theorists of argumentation have pointed out. And I want to describe this in terms of role taking and alter casting. Alter casting is basically when you take a role and this, this kind of informs the other one about the structure that you're starting. As you might remember, I said earlier on that we learn not just roles, but the role sets that they come with. So remember, roles are collections of norms and tasks, goals and typical behaviors, and we recognize it when others play them and we know the kinds of structures that they belong to so we can enter that structure with them then. So let's say that I come in and I say, I let you choose the movie last time and we said um, we would be fair in this and so it's my turn now. This is like a typical teeny tiny argument you get into with people. If you look just at that message, you can see that right the, the thing is that all the behaviors of a proponent in a persuasion dialogue are there. Right, This is an assertive statement of reasons and a conclusion in a non-conciliary tone. And there's an appeal to fairness here and not an offer of threat. So it's neither deliberation nor negotiation. It fits exactly with persuasion dialogues. So this is a message that signals that I have taken a proponent role in a persuasion dialogue. 
And we figure out our argument type through the way that we design such messages, right? A message that fits a proponent role also, right, doesn't just tell you something about the movies, it also invites you to, to play the complementary opponent role and get into a persuasion dialogue with me. And if you then respond with the message that fits an opponent role, then there's some kind of unspoken understanding about, about this between us. We now have an agreement underlying our disagreement about the dialogue type that we're gonna use in order to resolve this issue. So if you say something like, no way, you only let me choose because we'll have to sleep anyway. Right, and when we have this unspoken understanding, then we each have the reasonable expectation that the norms associated with the dialogue type will govern this whole thing and that we will get to the kind of validity, right, our outcome will have the kind of validity that these kinds of dialogues have, right? And this then, this, these reasonable expectations that we both argue with that and will treat the outcome as having that kind of validity, then kind of gives this kind of moral import to the norms that come along with the dialogue type. But what if, right, what if you don't answer in a way that says you are happy to do this in a persuasion dialogue? What if you say something like, are you sure I feel like this is really complicated and can't we kind of work out together and go back a week and see who get, got to choose how often and so on? Well, then you've just not answered in the opponent way, right? And now we have a kind of disagreement underlying our, our disagreement or our issue about who gets to choose the movie is under, there's an underlying disagreement about how we're gonna resolve that issue now. And now the question is kind of who, who's able to push through the way that they want to argue. And generally it's gonna be the person that independent of the argument is in a better, in a more powerful position. And this might be because one has to be more on the lookout not to get the other one angry. Then the one who doesn't have to be on the lookout about getting anyone angry can push that they want to argue the way that they want to argue. Or right, one has better exit options, which means one of them is okay if the argument just fails and no resolution to the issue is found, and the other one really needs the issue involved. Then the one who's right, who's who's who can better better let the argument just fail is the one that can easier push that they are not gonna argue unless it's in a persuasion dialogue, for example. For example, a student who argues with the professor can't afford annoying the professor by refusing to argue the way that the professor obviously wants to argue. At least usually that's the case. So what have we seen from this now? We've seen that arguers design arguments through their argumentative behavior during the argument. By the way that they argue, they determine what kind of argument it is. And so they are responsible to design through their messages for a dialogue type that will avoid the harm and humiliation. So they're responsible to try and get to a dialogue type that's not gonna silence anyone, that's gonna take the right kinds of reasons into account. And once there is an agreement about the kind of dialogue type that they're in, then reliance reasons kick in that make the dialogue kind of associated norms now morally relevant. What does that mean for moral principles and argumentation like the principle of charity or the prohibition of using fallacies? Well, whether some kind of behavior like using a type of argument or using a certain amount of effort towards charity is morally required or permissible in an argument depends on what kind of argument it is, right? But which kind of argument we should should have is then depending on a whole host of considerations, some of which might take, might kind of refer back to things like how charitable this dialogue type will require people to be, if you remember the kind of hair color issue. So moral reasons applicable to argument cannot be summarized into kind of straightforward moral principles of argumentation. We can't think of the ethics of arguing as a set of universally applicable norms, not even if we contextualize the dialogue types. Rather, I think we must think of it as a kind of multi-layered role ethics in which moral reasons apply at at least two levels, right? First of all, they apply to our argumentative behavior at the level of argument design. They determine which types of dialogue we can permissibly select for when we behave in, during arguing. And then moral reasons apply within the selected dialogue types because once an understanding about the dialogue type has been reached, it's right, the specific norms that belong to it now generate kind of moral demands to observe them. So there's an ethics of role taking here and an ethics of role playing. 
And because role taking happens through role playing, both levels apply to the same behavior, namely our argumentative behavior that when we present our try to present our reasons. And if that sounds complicated, right, that, that's only the half of it. Because arguments develop in unforeseen ways, new topics come up, people realize that they thought they had all their reasons together, but really they can't formulate something. It can very well happen that in the middle of a persuasion dialogue, we suddenly realize that someone's being silenced. And so now we have to switch dialogue types. So we can't ever forget about the ethics of role taking while we argue that it kind of continues through and can tell us that what we thought was an acceptable way to resolve the issue actually is not, we have to change things around. Just one more small thing and then I'm finished. Um, I want to remark that I kind of haven't challenged Walton's canon of dialogue types here. I've just worked within the six or seven that he says there are, but obviously, right, we have to recognize um, that the idea that these are the only ways to argue towards valuable forms of validity is questionable at best and really problematic. And so there is probably a third layer of ethics to this, one that deals with it, what we do when we realize that we don't recognize the way that someone else argues and therefore have reasons to think that we're confronted with the dialogue type and the kind of validity that it may create that we don't know. Um, but this is so extremely complicated and I've talked for so long that I just will hope that no one asks me any questions about this. Um, thank you very much uh, for listening for so long. Um, and thank you for coming to the speaker series. It means a lot to us.